First of all, I want to thank all the brethren here for inviting me and my wife and family up here to visit with you all. We so appreciate this weekend. My daughter was telling me yesterday, I wish we could stay for a whole week. I said, well, who knows? In the future, they might invite us for a whole week to come up. But um, she really enjoyed being with Brother Clinton Dean and his family. And we want to let them know that we appreciate them showing hospitality to us and inviting us in their home. And we appreciate their uh, service they showed to us. Hopefully, they'll come down that way one day and we'll put y'all up. But we appreciate y'all doing that. And we appreciate the brother feeding us and coming to all the services and great attendance and encouraging me and the preaching of God's word. And I hope to see you, brother, again. First of all, with us, not to, we'll just see how things go. But right now, I want to teach my last lesson that I'm going to teach. I heard that Brother Stan wants me to preach for them tonight, so I'm not going to get a break. <laughs> we go right over there and preach for them. But I love preaching, so that's not what bother me at all. I'm going to look at a lesson this morning dealing with a subject that is taken from the book of Colossians. So let's turn to Colossians chapter 3, please. And let us notice Colossians chapter 3. And we're going to look at the first five verses of this chapter. Colossians chapter 3, the first five verses. I'm reading from the King James translation, by the way. Some translations might read this way. Since ye be risen with Christ, because the word if there means since. Since ye then be risen with Christ, that's through baptism, of course. It says, seek those things which are above, where Christ sit upon the right hand of God. Set your affection, some translation might say mine, on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is out of life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Multify therefore your members, which be upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, ignorance, defection, evil conspicuous, and then he says, cover this which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. From the reading of this text this morning, we're going to look at this subject dealing with set your affections. Are your affections set in a safe place? They need to be in a set in a safe place if you're going to please God. Because sometimes our affection may not be in the right place. So hopefully this lesson will encourage us to want to serve God with all our heart. And we put God in everything we do. He's number one first in all that we do and say. And so the question I'm asking is, are your affections in a safe place? Now, I could have went through verse 10, but I chose verse 5 because that was enough reading. Because the verse that we are looking at is verse number 2. Let's notice some things. Most of us have frequently, and it's not anything new, misplaced things, such as these things, like your keys. You know if you misplaced your keys, you would go through your whole house. You would tear up your whole house trying to find your keys. One time I lost my glasses, and I went through the whole house trying to find those glasses because I wanted my eyeglasses, and I was going to tear the whole house up. And then someone told me they're sitting right on top of your head. <laughs> That's something you know to sit up like that. Well, what about credit cards? Now, I lost my credit card before, and I'm telling you, that's something to be concerned about because the way people are today in theft and stealing things, you're concerned about your credit card. And I have lost my credit card before. As a matter of fact, I don't know how someone got a hold of my credit card number, but this month, someone took off $250 off my credit card. And it was up in Virginia somewhere, Washington somewhere when they did this. And I said, I haven't been up in no Washington. They said, somebody did that. So I had to call them, cancel the car. They're going to send the people to search it out. And they, what, they, what I was happy about was they told me, we're going to give you your money back. I was so glad. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, some lose their children. You go to these fairs, uh, um, go to these events where a lot of children are. Sometimes parents lose their children every once in a while. Some even lose money. I remember one man lost his wife. What he was doing, he was traveling in the van. He was going to some location. She was sitting in the back of the van, just busy saying and all, and talking and all. And he stopped at a service station. And he went to pump gas. He thought his wife uh, was still in the van sitting there. So he pumped the gas, paid, and got in there and drove about, I guess, about 100 miles down the road. Oh and then he turned around and he saw his wife with him. <laughs> but here's some bad news. He said, I don't know should I go get her now. <laughs> <laughs> That's not good, is it? <laughs> well, the word affection here denotes warm attachment, love, foundness. That's what the word affection means. It refers to our mind, our heart, our thoughts, our thinking, 
Can anyone divide their affection between two spouses? No. No one wants to do that. You have one spouse, but you're thinking about another one or someone else or something else. That just won't work because no one wants that to be divided. But look at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. And here's what Jesus said in the sixth chapter of Matthew. This, of course, is dealing with the Sermon on the Mount. He's continuing the Sermon on the Mount with his text. And he's telling us where our priorities should be at. Notice he says, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon or wealth. Or that can mean riches, but you can't do it. You can't be divided. James tells us in James chapter 1, we can't be divided. In James chapter 1, James says this in verse number um, 6. He says, But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth or doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. He says, Don't let that man think he's going to receive anything of the Lord, not when you're divided like that. Then he says, a double-minded or two-souled man is unstable in his ways. So we cannot be divided and have our affections divided and expect to please God. There's no way we'll be able to do it. The heart is the center of our affections. That's where our thinking, everything comes from. And one cannot think wrong and do right. Or think right and do wrong. It just won't work. Proverbs 27, 3, or 23 to 27, rather, it tells us something important about our heart in that text. This is what Solomon wrote hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, if you want to say thousands, he said this, he wrote this. Proverbs chapter 23, and the verse is number 7. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. But notice the first part again. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Well, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 12 that our words will condemn us and our thoughts as well. Let's notice what he says in the 12th chapter of Matthew. Verse 36 is a real um, popular verse for many people because I hear many denominational preachers quoting this text all the time. But let's look at it here carefully here. Matthew chapter 12, I'm going to start with verse number 34. And here's what Jesus says in this text, Matthew 12 and 34. The text we, O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things, good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that man shall speak, they shall give an account. Therefore, in the day of judgment. Now you see that the thoughts come from the heart according to this text. I would also advise you to read Matthew chapter 15 because in that 15th chapter he talks about fornication, idolatry, evil thoughts. Those things start in the heart. They start in the mind. So our affections are very important where we place them at. Our affections should be properly placed in a proper place. And that is, he tells us right there in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1 and 2 where they should be placed at. And it should be on things above, not on things of this world. And he tells us that right in Colossians 3, and I read it earlier when I started this lesson. I read that text, but now I'll go back because it's very important that we refresh our memory on what we read. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ stood from the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above and not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. That's why we need to set our heart and mind on things of love. We have been raised from the water gave of baptism according to this text. And now we are to walk in newness of life. We are a new creation in God <coughs> Jesus. We should seek things above. We shouldn't be practicing sin anymore. And in Romans chapter 6, Paul talk, tells us in that 6th chapter that our minds shouldn't be on practicing sin, but it should be on serving the Lord. What? What shall we say then? Shall we continue sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live in the longer day in? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized, this is verse number three, baptized into Christ Jesus, were <coughs> baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we shall walk in newness of life. That's what we need to remember. 
Our affection should be on the new things now, on things above, on doing the things that God wants us to do. Here's the reason why. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, <coughs> we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. We ought to serve God and seek things above rather than the things of this earth. Let us notice Colossians 3, which I read. But in Colossians 3, he just uses, he says a little, uh, a few more things more um, than, um, was, uh, than was written in the first part of this verse. Because these Gentiles, most of the Gentiles that he's talking to here, you know, Gentiles were doing the things of the world, involved and wrapped up in the world of this. But if you notice verse 7 of this text, it says, in which he also walked sometime when he lived in them. But now he also put off these, uh, all these anger, wrath, malice, blaspheme, or filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man, and he said, with his deeds. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bound nor free, but Christ is all and all. Put on, therefore, all, I mean, as the elect of God, holy beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness. This is the opposite of what we read in verse number 8. And he says, meekness, long suffering. And it goes on with forebearance, and he mentions several other things. But all of this has to do with our thinking is now new. We don't do or think on the things that were in the past, but we move forward. And before our conversion, we lived in these things. Paul even included himself that he even said he lived in these things. He lived a, a life that was not pleasing to God at one time. So did we. We, we weren't born Christians. We did sin. We transgressed God's law. But now we seek his kingdom first. We seek his law. We want to do those things that's pleasing in this life. Our affairs now has to do with pleasing God and things above, not on this earth. And Romans chapter 8 is just another text, but let me read 1 Peter chapter 4. I, I like it better. So that's the one I want to read. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4 right quick. And notice in this fourth chapter what Peter writes here to these Jewish brethren as well as us today. Notice he says, For as much then as Christ hath suffered in the flesh, or suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves, equip yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. Every Christian should do that. We don't go backwards. We go forward. We want to grow in his grace and knowledge. We want to be better people than we were in the past. He says, for the time past, our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness and lust and excesses of um, drinking or drunkenness or wine or revelings or, or banqueting or abundable adulteries. These are just some of the names of these sins, drinking parties and carousing. We don't do that anymore. He says, wherein they, that is the people of the world, non-Christians, think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess or flood or riot and speaking evil of you. We don't want to do those. In the past, we lived that way. Now we don't want to do that now. Now we want to seek God's kingdom first. So now that we have been converted, our interests are really different from the past. We want to seek Christ. Our destiny is to live forever with the Lord now. We want to be with him. So we set our minds on him, and we seek his kingdom first. Look at Romans 8, 12, please. The 12th chapter, the 8th chapter of Romans is verse number 12, please. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 12. And here's what Paul wrote to these brethren of the Church of Christ in Rome. He wrote in verse number 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh. We are not bound servant to that anymore. To live after the flesh. If ye then uh, live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do multiply, that is, put to death the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. We don't go back to those things anymore. Unfortunately, there are brethren that do go back. 
Some really never left. They never left those things. They committed and involved in. I read this text already. Psalms 119 is a wonderful text if you like to look at it, but I'll just read it since it's just one scripture. This is 119 Psalm, longest chapter in the Bible. 176 Psalms, I believe, are from right, but longest chapter. But we just want to look at one particular verse in the 119th Psalm. Verse 127, please. Notice <laughs> what the psalmist wrote in this text. You know, when you get one of those new Bibles, you got to keep on waiting your thumb to get to everything. <laughs> Uh, it says in this text right here, verse 27, Therefore I love thy commandments above gold, yeah, above fine gold. This is what happens when you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. You want to seek him first. You want to seek his laws. You want to do the things that please God. And I said it over, but that's what God's word teaches us to do. That's what it means by placing our affection, our mind on things above, not on things of this world. Even though we live in the world, we're not of the world. And we need to always remember that. Our affections are not to be placed on certain things. Let's look at some of them real quick. We must not be primarily concerned about our own selves. Now, what I mean by that is that you're thinking more of yourself than you're thinking about God. You're only concerned about what pleases you, what makes you happy, what makes you feel good, rather than what God wants us to do. That's what I mean by our own selves. And then notice also, we ought to be concerned with the welfare of a soul. How we to treat others and how we are to serve God. That's what we should be concerned about. That's what it means to place your affections on things above. But some place their things not on things above, and so they place them on self. And Romans 12, 3 lets us know that's not the thing to do. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 3. And I, I read this last night, if you still remember, I taught on it a little bit. But let's look at that 12th chapter again. This time we want verse number 3. But I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according to, according as God hath dealt to every man the merits of faith. That's where it should be at. Not on self, concerned only about concern about self. And Mark 12, he mentioned that in the 12th chapter of Mark. This is what Jesus said in that text. This is Mark chapter 12. And the verse is 29 of that 12th chapter. Mark 12 and 29. Notice the verse. Well, it says, and Jesus answered him, first of all, the commandments in this people of Israel, the Lord our God is our, is our one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment he mentioned. Verse 31. And the second is like unto, namely, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That's not thinking only of yourself. That's thinking about others as well. But love thy neighbor as thyself. He tells us in this text here. So we ought to be concerned about others. And being of selfish and thinking of yourself only is not going to please the Lord. It's not seeking things above. First Corinthians 9, 27, Paul talked about how he buffered his body. To keep it under control and bring it into subjection. And that's what we need to do as Christians. Notice this. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, please, and verse number 27. Now, I like the word discipline. Some translation will use the word discipline. I like that better. But I keep under my body. That is, I discipline my body. The New American Standard Version says that. And bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway, or disqualified. But look at the verse before that. He says, and every man that strives or competes for the gains is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertain. So I might, um, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. That word there, he used that word I keep, a discipline, you know, um, some fellow was saying one time, that means buffet. He said, Paul buffet his body all the time. He found him a buffet all the time. That's not what the thing say. That's somebody misinterpreted the scriptures. Paul is saying he disciplined his body. We all need to do that. We need to control our talk. We need to control what we see, what we handle with our hands. And I mentioned last night, our body don't belong to us to do anything we want to do with it. So we have to take control of it. 
And Paul mentioned that right here in this text. James 1, 27, what we ought to do. We'll talk about where not to place your affection, where some people have placed their affection. In James chapter 1 and verse 27, even though many brethren have taken this scripture out of context to teach that they, this scripture gives them authority to build offering homes and nursing homes and all of this, and that this is referring to the church um, being benevolent to non-Christians, that's not what this text is saying. Notice, pure religion and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit the fatherless, that's orphans, but that's not giving us authority to build an orphan home at all. This is an individual responsibility that he's talking about here. Widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Notice, keep himself unspotted from the world. So we are concerned with the welfare of the soul, how we treat others and how we serve God, because these texts let us know that, and we need to be concerned. Romans 12, 1 and 2 again, we are to offer sacrifices to God. They're not animal sacrifices, but they're spiritual sacrifices we offer to God, giving ourselves total, totally over to God is what we as Christians should do. Then let's notice, but we are not to be self-centered. Not only selfish, but not self-centered either. Luke 18, remember those two fellows went in the temple to pray, the publican and the Pharisee? Well, one went in and said, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, like this man, and he mentioned several other names. And really, he wasn't concerned about anybody but himself. And what did the tax collector do? Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. He understood the position that he was in. And Jesus was pleased with him than the other. Sometimes we can become self-centered and not think about anyone but ourselves. That's not going to please God. Look at Acts chapter 8 and verse 9. Acts chapter 8 and verse number 9. This is, um, of course, it's dealing with those Jewish brethren who were being persecuted. But let's notice what verse 9 says. Verse 9 says, but there was a certain man called Simon, which uh, before time, uh, before time in the same city, used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. Did you notice that? It says, and he, well, it says that he that at all, excuse me, giving out that himself was some great one. What was he thinking about? He was only thinking and concerned about himself. That's what he was concerned about. But thank God that he did obey the gospel of Christ, and he did commit the sin in that eighth chapter, and he was told he can't purchase the Holy Spirit with money. Peter told him that, and he did repent it and ask prayer. So, thank goodness he changed his heart, but at first, that's what he was involved in. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 3. Here's Paul writing his last letter to Timothy, the young evangelist, encouraging this young man, and listen at this verse. Now keep in mind self-centeredness. That's what we're looking at. It says here, he's talking about an uh, imperative time shall come, verse number one. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, ungrateful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of that which is good. Now, what we want to recognize is not verse 3, but verse number 2, where it says, For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Those are people that are self-centered, or self-centered or selfish when they go. They won't please the Lord. We are not to place our affection on money. Money is not the sin. It's the love of money that turns it into a sin, as Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10. But some place their affections on money. That's all they think about is money. Like the fellow won the lottery here recently. And I don't know if it happened in this state, but in Arkansas, a fellow won 400 and some million dollars. He said, I'm rich now. Well, his affections is his own, his money. We are, there's nothing wrong with money. It's the love of money. Because if you brethren thought that money was wrong, I would ask you when the service over, give me all your money. I'll take it and go back home with it. You're more than happy to. That's the way you look at it. <laughs> So we need to recognize what he's really saying here in this text. It's the love of money that turns it into a sin. Look at the rich fool who wasted his money. Look what he did. He was only concerned about himself. He wasn't concerned about others. This is what Jesus teaches us in this text here. Look at Luke chapter 12. And look at this. I'm not going to read all those verses 21. I just want you to see the attitude of this man. 
And verse number 13, it starts, And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed and be aware of covetousness, that's greed for money. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesses. It really does not. And he spake the parable unto them, saying, The grounds of a certain rich man are poor plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room to restore my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and, and build greater, and there I will restore all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, So thou hast much laid up for many years. Take thy knees, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then shall who um, then shall, shall those things be, who shall it be? Which thou hast provided. See, you notice that he was he kept saying me, 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 mine. He wasn't thinking about anyone else. He wasn't thinking about God. He wasn't thinking about anyone else except himself. Same thing happened right here with the young rich ruler in Matthew's chapter. That's the rich fool we just talked about. This is the rich young man here in Matthew 19. He could have followed Christ. He could have followed Christ, but he turned it down because he had great riches. And he was not willing to take those riches to share with someone else. So he became self-centered. And he walked away from Christ grievous because he loved riches. That's what gets us in trouble right there. His affections were not in the right place. Ananias and Sapphira lied in Acts chapter 5 about what they gave. They really didn't have to do it at all. They could have just gave and not said anything. But they said they gave something different. And, of course, they lied to God and the Holy Spirit, and both of them died. I'm so thankful that God is not killing people like that today. <laughs> the congregation probably won't have a lot of members, you know. <laughs> so I'm thankful. But still, they died because they lied. and really didn't have to do that at all. They don't want to think about their wishes. And then Proverbs 23, you know how the money is, is um, you put it in your pocket, or you just, it tastes off like an eagle. You only have it for a couple minutes, and it's gone. You got to stay along with it. Get ready to die. No matter how you try to put it away and save it, something always happens to come up where you're going to use that money for some reason. So we must not place our affections on sin for our worldly pleasures. We must not please God. Because these earthly pleasures are short lived. You know what Moses, what Moses said when the Hebrew writer, I believe Paul is the Hebrew writer, when he wrote in Hebrews chapter 11, he wrote this in that 11th chapter. This is concerning Moses. You know, Moses could have had great riches and all. He was Pharaoh's second. I mean, he really could. But notice what it says in this text, though. Hebrews chapter 11, <clears throat> in verse number 24, please. Here's what the Hebrew writer says concerning him, Moses. Moses had a good heart. His mind was in the right place. It says, by faith, verse 23, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child. And they were not afraid of the king's commandments. By faith, Moses, when he was come to year, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now, this Greek word for pleasure here is only found two times in the New Testament. The next time you see it is in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17. And guess how it's used there? 1 Timothy chapter 6 and 17 is the next time you see, and the last time you'll see that Greek word mentioned. But let me read verse 17. 1 Timothy 6, 17 says, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, not trusting uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Or literally, uh, for our enjoyment. That's the literal Greek meaning of the word right there. But we need to recognize what we just read in that text. Moses turned it down. He read a suffer affliction with the people of God and enjoy sin for a season. He did. He had his mind, his heart in the right place. Solomon had to learn this. He had all the things he wanted, singers, gardens, beautiful homes, everything you could think of, he had it. But he said his vanity. He finally came to his sense and realized what it was. You can have everything in the world. 
Remember what Jesus said in Matthew um, 16, 26? <laughs> Matthew chapter 16, verse 26? Here's what Jesus said concerning this point I'm making about Solomon here. Remember, it goes like this. For what is a man profit if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Nothing. There's nothing more valuable than your soul. So Solomon had to learn this the hard way. These are people who have their affections in the wrong place. Even Paul told Timothy that the things that we brought in that came to the other world, you can't take them away with you. You can't. No matter how hard you try, you can't. Someone that's going to take everything you have when you die, they're going to use it. You're not taking it with you. Babies come to this world empty-handed, and we leave from this earth with empty-handed. And so let's recognize that. But let me read this text for you here in a way. This is on 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse number 7. And I like what Paul said to Timothy here um, in this, this concerning this text here. It says, um, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. That's true. We can't. So we must not place our affections on sin for our worldly pleasures. Because they are temporary and they're going to be destroyed one day. Even Job said in Job 1 and 21 when he lost everything, he didn't blame God for it. He didn't. He understood. Lord give it, Lord take it away. He understood that. Now let's notice something else about this lesson this morning. Following sinful pleasure leads to death. <coughs> And spiritual eternity, that's what it leads to. All these people that love their pleasure more than they love God, who seek things of this world more than they seek God first, they're going to be lost. And they're not going to take any of, thing, any of these things with them. Look at what he says about the widows, the young widows, found in 1 Timothy chapter 5, and verse 6. He's talking about the young widows here. Not the older widows, the younger ones he's talking about here. And in 1 Timothy 6, and verse, I mean, um, chapter 5, and verse number 6, he says this concerning the young widows. Now she that is a widow indeed, and desolated, trusting in God, and continuing after um, supplications and prayers night and day. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. And these things give in charge that they may be blamed, um, blameless. But in his pride not, he talks about in pride not for his own family. He's worse than an unbeliever, infidel. But the point I'm making is this. Look at verse 4. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety. That is, honor and respect. That is, he says, their godliness. And requite their parents. That is, return good to their parents. For that is good and acceptable. But she that is a widow in need, this is, of course, the widow that's sick to know that the church can help that he's talking about here, of course. But I've just mentioned about the one living in pleasure. It's not pleasing to God. And that's what he says, living a luxurious life. So sinful pleasures, you know, you think that they are, um, he touched on that, but move on. Notice James chapter 1. James chapter 1 is wonderful text because it tells us how sin develops. It's not something you're born with. It's something that you commit. Sin is a transgression of the law of God, 1 John 3, 4. That's what it is. It's a transgression of the law of God. Babies are not born locked in sin, <laughs> evil, wicked, and need to be baptized like the Roman Catholics call themselves doing in their denominational teachings. That's not what the Bible teaches. But this is exactly how sin is committed right here in this text. In verse 13, let no man say when he is tempted, solicited to sin, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. Cannot. And neither tempt me any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away or lured away of his own lust, uncontrollable lust, and enticed. Then when lust have conceived, that word conceived means become swell or swell up or become pregnant. That's the word, that's what some translators use the word pregnant or swell up. It bring forth sin. And sin, when it is finished or completed, bring forth what? Death. Spiritual death, separation from God. <clears throat> That's how sin is developed. This is what these things of the world lead to. It will never please God according to what we read in the Bible. Luke 8.13 is another text I put down. You can look at that one if you like. That's a wonderful text. But let me move on so I can finish. Living in sinful pleasure will separate us from a holy God at will. 
Now our lesson is, where, do, where are you placing your affections at? Are you placing them on things of the world? Or are you placing them on God? In godliness, in godly things. That's a question you and I would have to answer. But living in sinful pleasure will separate us from the Holy God. It will. We can't live in, in sin and please God because Isaiah 59 tells us sin separates us from God. Look what it did to Adam and Eve in the garden. Why did God put them out the garden? Because of their sin. They were separated from God because of their sin. And they died a spiritual death and a physical death because of their sin. That's what we do. We're going to die physically because that's, that's something all of us have to go through because of what they did. And when we sin and transgress God's law and we don't repent of our sins, our sins will separate us from God. So we need to recognize what the Bible teaches concerning that. Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the pure in heart. We need to be pure in heart. That's what pleased God, is the ones that are pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It's the ones that are pure, that are doing the right things, that are pure. Hebrews 12 tells us, without holiness, you're not going to see God. Look at it, Hebrews 5, 14 and 15. Without holiness, you won't see God. And while each Christian is to live with great confidence, his trust in the Lord, he does not seek to be preeminent over others. We're not. And that's where that Seth thing come in I talked about earlier. Even in Colossians 1.18 makes that point about preeminent in that text. Colossians chapter 1.18. And I just mentioned the system here. Colossians 1.18. This is what Paul wrote to the church at Colossae. <clears throat> and he wrote this letter to these brethren. This is chapter 1, verse 18. Notice what it says there. And he and he's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. That just simply means to hold the first rank, or it means to be first or chief. And so while Christians who live with great confidence, which we ought to do, his trust is in the Lord. He does not seek to be preeminent over others. First, over others, in other words, it doesn't seek to do that. Romans 12, 3, show tells us we put others before us. How many of us do that? Put others before us. You know, the, the letters to the word joy is Jesus, others, and yourself. That's what the letters represent. How many of us have that? Even in Philippians 2 and 3, Christ set the perfect example for us to follow in that text. Listen at what, the, uh, what Paul wrote to the brethren of Philippi in Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 8. Notice what he wrote to them here in verse 3. Now he says, let nothing be done through strife, selfishness. That's another word you can use for that. Let nothing be done through selfishness or vain glory or empty conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. I've been over a brother at home who put us before them, themselves. They say, you can take my bed. I sleep downstairs. I've seen that happen several, several occasions. And when brother tell me my home is your home, they should tell me that because I'm going to the refrigerator. I'm going to find out what they got in there to eat, so don't tell me that. <laughs> brother Dean did that. He said, our home is yours. Just so happened I was full yesterday, so I couldn't have anyone looking for anything else. <laughs> but, but anyway, we want to put others before ourselves. That's the point I'm making here, to make sure we stick to the point being made. We need to put others before ourselves and not be printed by ourselves and thinking only of ourselves. See, that's what it means to set your affections above. We must not place our esteem on the world. Don't be concerned about the world so much. You know, John first, um, 2, 15 said, love not the world, not the things that are in the world. It's nothing wrong with the beautiful trees, the beautiful seasons, the beautiful earth that God created. He's not talking about the earth. He's talking about the wickedness of man. That is something we are not to love as Christians. <coughs> That's what he's telling us. Because in the next verse, he says, for all that is in the world, what? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. <coughs> So anything in con conflict with God, we are not to love it. It's just that plain and simple. The world of this passage is to spill evil that he's talking about. That all the things which stand opposed to God and Godliness. That is what Christians can't love. 
We are forbidden to love this cosmos. That's referring to the, uh, the world with which is opposed to God. And cosmos sometimes is referring to the earth or the world. Or age. Some translations say age. But here he's talking about the cosmos in it, which is opposed to God. You're living in this world, brethren. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. And we need to always remember that. The world we are forbidden to love is not the material universe. I know I made that statement already. Not the people of the world. Not the earth. All the visible elements of the world. Surroundings. Love used here does not refer to this kind of thing he's talking about. It's the evil around us. The love of our text is the emotions of selfish desire, greed, worldly pride. Having desire for those sinful elements that pertain to the society of men. That's what we can't love. God comes first in our life. The young rich ruler loved his riches more than he loved the God, didn't he? Matthew 19 shows that very plainly. And that's what we're talking about in this day. Let's look at something else here. Love for the world and love for the God are not the same. They are totally different. They're not the same. Matthew 6, 24 makes that very plain. When he said no man can serve two masters, he's going to serve one or hate the other. You can't serve both of them. God and man, you can't do it. That's the difference. James 4, 4, if a man is a, if you have a friend, if you are a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God. James chapter 4, verse 4. Our friendship can't be with the world. We can't love it. He tells us in that text, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, 2 Corinthians 6, 17, but in that text, he just showed us how important it is for us to recognize where we should put first things first, and that we can't love things of this world and expect to please God. Just those two verses, verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters. Well, he mentioned in that earlier, in verse number um, 14, be ye not, be ye not only ye yoked together with unbelievers, or with fellowship, what fellowship have I righteousness for unrighteousness? And he tells us what our affections should be at, now that we can't be divided. Romans 12, 1 and 2, I've read it several times already. This is being dedicated to God. Our sacrifices and be spiritual sacrifices to God. Galatians 2, 20, I used this yet, um, yesterday, showing you that Paul was dedicated to the Lord. He was totally dedicated to him. And um, this text, I read it again. This is um, Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 20. If you'd like to turn to your weapon too, I'm just going to read it. Verse 20 again. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate. Or, he says, cast aside the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the Lord, then Christ is dead in vain. But the first one to pay attention to is, I am crucified with Christ. That's what we need to recognize as Christians. Now let me mention this, and then we'll go to one more point, and I'll get ready to wrap this lesson up. We must not place our affections on receiving the praise of men. Too many brethren are doing this today because they are copying off the denominational people around us. The Baptists and Methodists and these other denominational churches, they're trying to mold themselves into these people. And so they're drifting away from God's teaching. That's what's happening with the brotherhood today. But we must not place our affections on receiving the praise of men. And here in John chapter 12, we find that there was a, a couple that did put themselves before God. They loved the praise of men. Didn't matter what God said, but they loved the praise of men. This is John chapter um, 12 and verse 42. And listen at this, what John wrote. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out the synagogue. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. That's not what you want. That's not what any of us should want. Same way in Acts chapter 12. What happened in Acts chapter 12? Well, Herod, I guess he wanted to show off. He dressed in a nice robe and all. And he had people giving him all kinds of alterations and all. And what happened to him? He died. Angel struck him. He died. 
and he was eaten by worms. Why? Because he gave not God the praise. That's why. Only concerned about himself. Our Lord did not seek the praise of man. Jesus didn't seek it when he was here. We shouldn't seek it as well. He didn't. We don't. So do you love the praise of men? Where are our freshness placed at? Are they placed in the right place? Are they on the world? We must not place our interest in the wages of unrighteousness. That's what 2 Peter 2.15 is talking about. You don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. You never push your interest in those things. And that's what Peter's talking about in this text. 2 Peter 2.15, please. I'd like to look at it. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 15. Notice it says that, um, in the text, which I just want to read here, dealing with false teachers, but here he's talking about these natural groups here he's talking about. But these are natural groups, in other words, unreasonable animals, in other words, beasts made to be taken or captured and destroyed or killed, speak evil of things that they understand not. They are ignorant of those things he's saying. And shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Then now verse 15 is the text you won't notice. Which have forsaken, abandoned the right way, and are going astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozo, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. See, he loved the wages of unrighteousness, so he wasn't pleasing to God. And of course, that passage makes that very plain. They left the right way. Instead of going a straight path, they didn't do that. One cannot leave a road without having been on the road first. So this is what they did. And one cannot go astray unless he once was all right. But this is what happens when you place your affections on things of the world. We must not place our interest in the wages of unrighteousness. Things that won't please the Lord. The word way here in this text refers to the correct way of thinking, deciding, a way of conduct, and a course that is level for a life that never ends. That's what that way is referring to. But they left this. That's it. They want to go that way no more. And then we'll close with astray. Look at that word astray there. I'm talking in the same text of 2 Peter, by the way. I'm just explaining a couple words in there. Astray is from a word which means to be deceived or to deceive, to lead astray. And it's often um, given as to error. That's what the word means. And what these few words tell us, us is simply the fact that not only did they go astray, but they followed that course of Balaam's actions in the end. Oh. Balaam was more interested in obtaining money for unrighteousness than doing that which God wanted him to do. He just was torn between the two. And he gave in to the wrong. So Balaam later was slain because of his wickedness. That's in Numbers 13, 31. In verse number eight, that's all. We, it's you know, all that found in Second Peter, chapter um, two, in verse fifteen. And these false teachers that he's talking about, therefore, were guilty of fully imitating Balaam. That's what they did. Let's move on here so we can try to wrap it. All unrighteousness, according to John, First John, chapter five, seventeen. All unrighteousness is sin. Unrighteousness is sin. Separation from God. Christians can fall from the Lord. God's word makes it very plain that you do it. These are just a few of the texts. I'm not going to read all of these, but you can write them down. But Paul gave a warning to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Take heed. You need to take heed as you fall, because they can fall. James talks about brethren that have errors from the Lord. Then out of town of Hymenaeus is mentioned in 1 Timothy 1, 19. These fellows went astray. 1 Timothy chapter 1, 19 and 20. These two fellows mentioned in that text. The right way, the way of God's truth. Following the gospel system. This is where our interest should be. And that's what Paul is talking about in that text. And I won't read all these scriptures and go back to some of you might want to write one of them down or two of them down, but I don't want to run through those. But this is where our interest should be. It should be on seeking things above. Matthew 6, 33. We talked about that one already. These other texts are good too. 1 Peter 2.24, 1 John 1, um, 2.29. I won't have time to read all of those, but 
I want to leave it there for a second in case someone is writing down it. This, this, this is being recorded, so you'll get a chance to catch them again. But I just wanted to mention them anyway. Then this is the last, well, that's it. <laughs> I'm looking for some more. And nobody here didn't say amen either, so that, <laughs> you know what? You are wise not to say amen, because if you say amen, I'm going to stay up here longer. <laughs> because the brethren who I preach at in Hackburn, they don't say amen either. They're black audience. They don't say amen. Like, every once in a while, they'll say amen. They know that if they say amen, they go, oh, Brother Carl going to be up there another 20 minutes, so let's keep quiet. <laughs> let's do what some of the white brethren do. <laughs> let's go ahead and close this this morning. Our faces must not be placed on these things that we talked about, on self, money, pleasures, on the world, on the praise of men, on the wages of unrighteousness. There's no way we can please them. Our affections must be placed on the correct things, things above, upon the law of God, upon pure and holy things. So where are your affections placed today? Where are they? What are you thinking about at this present moment? Godly things are things of the world. If they are not on spiritual items, you need to make a change. We need to examine ourselves to see where we stand today. Because that can change. If you're a alien sinner, you're outside of Christ. You can obey Christ this morning and become a new creation in Christ Jesus by obeying the New Testament plan of salvation. And all you have to do is hear God's word, be taught God's word. You need to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You need to be willing to repent of your sins this morning, making a change of a heart, changing your heart, making a confession that Christ is the Son of God, and then being baptized in water for remission of sins. And then I put Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10 on here. You know what that text says? That those who are faithful, who are Christians, must live faithful till death. Be faithful till death. Even if it calls for you to die for the cause of Christ, you need to be faithful till death, every one of us. So I appreciate you, brother, inviting me down to preach this weekend meeting. I hope that I said something that will encourage you to everyone and that I didn't um, leave off things that need to be spoken of, but that I did the best I could. And I hope you all got some out of them. And my family and I, we appreciate being here with you all. So we're going to go ahead and stand now and sing the imitation song. <laughs>